Welcome back to The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology. So this is the 17th in a series, um, and we're going to talk this today about ventilatory muscle function, part one. So this is The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology. And as you can see, we're moving along. We want to approach this with the enthusiasm of a kid in a candy shop. We have previously been talking about the lungs. And remember that gas exchange is determined primarily by the ratio of ventilation and perfusion, or VQ. The normal VQ ratio is one, which gives us a normal alveolar O2 of about 100 and a normal alveolar CO2 of 40. There are only two possible abnormalities, VQ greater than one, which is oxygen greater than normal and CO2 less than normal, and VQ less than one, which is oxygen less than normal and CO2 greater than normal. In addition, we talked about the fact that the distribution of ventilation in the lung is really determined by only two things. Decreased distensibility, so you can see if this lung is stiff, not as many air molecules are going to go into this side as in this side, and airway obstruction. Again, if this airway is narrow, then not as many air molecules will go into this side as in this side. So we're now going to leave the lungs, although not the respiratory system, and talk about the respiratory balance and ventilatory muscle function in terms of basics and the physical examination, inspiratory muscle strength, and expiratory muscle strength. So the respiratory balance. In order to achieve adequate ventilation, ventilatory muscle power and central drive, which we'll discuss down the road, need to be adequate to overcome the respiratory load. So if the balance is tipped in this direction, it's adequate ventilation. If the balance is tipped in this direction, that is, if these are inadequate to overcome the respiratory load, then you have inadequate ventilation or respiratory failure. So the normal individual looks like this. You have more than adequate ventilatory muscle power to overcome the respiratory load, and in fact, you can increase um, your ventilation, ventilatory muscle power, if the respiratory load increases. If you have decreased ventilatory muscle power and or decreased central drive, then your balance might be more precariously positioned like this, or if it's significantly decreased, then central uh, drive and or ventilatory muscle power might be inadequate to overcome the respiratory load, and this would tip the balance in the direction of inadequate ventilation or respiratory failure. Now, sometimes the respiratory load increases, even in normal individuals, for example, in pneumonia, or perhaps one could argue during exercise. Ordinarily, central drive will increase, which will increase ventilatory muscle power so that you can keep up with this increased respiratory load. So this would be a normal compensation for severe lung disease, for example. However, if the, either the respiratory load is too great and or there is an inability to uh, completely compensate, then even though central drive and ventilatory ventilatory muscle power have increased, they have not increased enough to overcome this huge increase in respiratory load and respiratory failure will again result. So respiratory failure then, inadequate ventilatory muscle power, inadequate central drive, and or increased respiratory load, which will tip the balance in this direction. Central drive and ventilatory muscle power must be adequate to overcome the respiratory load in order to achieve adequate ventilation. Now for this, in the next few presentations, we're going to be talking primarily about ventilatory muscle power. We'll get to central drive a little bit later. So this is not rocket science. So let's talk about the basics and the physical examination of ventilatory muscle function. Inspiration requires active contraction of the ventilatory muscles, and the diaphragm is the major muscle of breathing. Exhalation is passive in quiet breathing. The diaphragm is the major muscle of breathing. Its motor innervation is via the phrenic nerve, which actually comes out of the spinal cord at cervical three, four, five level. Intercostal muscles, their function is primarily to maintain chest wall stability and to optimize diaphragm function. And they're innervated by thoracic vertebral nerves at each a level. So for example, the uh, um, intercostal muscles at uh, T6, would be innervated by the T6 vertebral nerves. So this is, we view this as a person, this is how the diaphragm works. So the diaphragm contracts, it increases intra-abdominal pressure, all right, that spreads and raises the base of the rib cage, which decreases intrathoracic pressure, allowing inspiration. 
Actually, Duchenne of Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy fame was the person who realized that the diaphragm, when it contracts, uses the intra-abdominal contents kind of like a fulcrum. And so when it contracts, this actually spreads and raises the base of the rib cage, which increases its volume and thereby decreases its pressure. Of course, in addition, the diaphragm has what's called the zone of apposition. So a lot of the diaphragm runs parallel to the abdominal wall, all right? And so when this contracts, it basically causes the piston action of the diaphragm. It lowers this dome of the abdomen because these fibers are shortening. And this is about what the zone of apposition is. You can see it's fairly large over the chest, but all of this diaphragm runs parallel to the abdominal wall, and therefore its contraction lowers this dome. Normally, if one is breathing, when you breathe in, the diaphragm descends. The abdominal contents basically can be, can be viewed as a liquid-filled content, if you will, so that it's incompressible. So if you push the diaphragm down, the abdomen has to expand, out, expand outward. So in general, outward motion of the, of the abdomen indicates diaphragm contraction. During uh, exhalation, the diaphragm rises again and abdominal contents can go in. So normal situation, inspiration, abdomen goes out, exhalation, abdomen comes in. That's normal diaphragm function. Shown here again, in this case, in the supine position, here's the chest, here's the abdomen, the diaphragm contracts. This is incompressible, fluid-filled sensory container so that if you push down here, it's got to go out here. We often use fluoroscopy to decide if somebody um, has diaphragm paralysis. So on the count of three, I want you to take a brief, deep breath. One, two, three. All right, I can't see you, but I can be pretty certain that most of you, when you took that deep breath, raised your shoulders primarily and did not cause that inspiration with the diaphragm. Or rapid deep inspiration, people often use intercostal accessory muscles and raise their shoulder and not necessarily their diaphragm. So this is the most common deep breath that people take if I ask you to suddenly do that. Obviously, if you were to do a fluoroscopy, what you would see is both diaphragms moving upward because they're not what's causing the contraction. And a radiologist, for example, might misinterpret that as bilateral diaphragm paralysis. Now, think about uh, sniffing like a rose, like that. If you do that, put your hand on your belly and do that again. You'll note that your belly goes out. When you're sniffing, you use your diaphragm to contract. So this is a trick that one can use if you want to see diaphragm function, assuming you have a cooperative subject, ask them to sniff, not just take a deep breath. And this would show you whether the diaphragms are functional or not. So common errors in, in fluoroscopy. Uh, one big one is if a child is on a ventilator and we want to know if they've got diaphragm paralysis, they don't take the child off the ventilator. So obviously if they do that during inspiration, the diaphragms are going to go down because they're being pushed down by the ventilator. The second one is not paying attention to inspiration versus exhalation, right? So if somebody has a paralyzed diaphragm, it will move but it will go up during inspiration, not down. So you need to pay attention. And finally, not instructing the patient to sniff. So bilateral diaphragm paralysis is the opposite. Now here, the diaphragms are not moving, all right? So you're generating a negative pressure in the thorax by intercostal accessory muscle activity. And that, if you will, sucks the diaphragms up. So they will move paradoxically um, and rise during inspiration fall during exhalation. And that's shown here. If we have diaphragm paralysis, when you use your intercostal accessory muscles to take a breath, you're actually going to uh, develop more space, if you will, in the abdomen. So the abdomen will decrease. It won't expand outward. It will expand inward. Just to summarize this, the normal situation, diaphragm contracting, pushing abdominal contents out, in this case, diaphragm not contracting intercostal accessory muscles, and the, so the, the abdomen actually uh, paradoxically moves inward during inspiration rather than outward as it should. A clinical law, always assess diaphragm function by palpating the abdomen during inspiration. 
you may need to ask the patient to sniff. So this should be part of your physical examination, um, especially in patients with neuromuscular disease or suspected diaphragm weakness. And this is fairly simple to do. Uh, and you can often have a very good as uh, assessment about diaphragm function based on a physical examination alone. So a true story, many years ago, I was asked to see a patient with Apert syndrome in consultation, who of course had very severe upper airway obstruction. And when I examined the patient, I noted exactly this problem, that when he inspired, his abdomen moved in and not out. We were consulted because he had CO2 retention. And I told the ENT doctors, you have a bigger problem than just upper airway obstruction. This child has diaphragm paralysis as well. He didn't quite believe me, but for us could be bored out. But nevertheless, you could tell this based on physical examination alone. So you can have unilateral diaphragm paralysis. And so if you have, for example, a left-sided diaphragm paralysis, then during inspiration, what's going to happen is the right side will descend as it's supposed to. It will increase intradormal pressure, which will push the paralyzed diaphragm upwards. All right. This is called pendulous motion. And what happens here, unfortunately, is during inspiration, you've driven this diaphragm up. During exhalation, the diaphragm comes back down. And the problem is that you just exchange air between these two lungs. So pendulum motion is a particularly difficult um, or problematic situation because even if the patient tries to breathe harder, okay, then it just causes more air to go back and forth. And this is one of the indications for plication of a diaphragm to prevent that paradoxical motion. And you can see that here. If the diaphragm is plicated, that is, it's held tight, then it will no longer move paradoxically, and you actually end up getting better ventilation. So plication fixes a paralyzed diaphragm to prevent passive movement. And the two indications for plication are to stop paradoxical motion of a paralyzed hemidiaphragm. And also, if a paralyzed hemidiaphragm is high in the chest compressing the lungs, this would be another indication for plication to expand uh, room in the chest for the lungs. Intercostal muscle paralysis would actually give you paradoxical inward motion of the thorax during inspiration as shown here. So intercostal muscles, remember their primary function is to contract synchronously with the diaphragm so that they support the chest wall, prevent it from collapsing inward. If you have paralyzed intercostal muscles, and this, for example, would occur in a spinal cord injury at, let's say, C6 or 7, all right, the diaphragm would still work. It comes off C3, 4, 5, but the intercostal muscles, that is, coming off in the thoracic vertebrae below that would be paralyzed. Also, as you'll learn, REM sleep is essentially a neuromuscular blockade of all muscles, except the eye muscles and diaphragm, and it is also associated with a relative intercostal muscle paralysis. So skeletal muscle function, uh, we can really think about this in two parts, strength and endurance. So let's talk about strength. So inspiratory muscle strength. Right. Skeletal muscle strength is the maximum tension that can be developed. All right. It's proportional to muscle cross-sectional area and ventilatory muscles generate pressure. We just talked about that. So ventilatory muscle strength is the maximal respiratory pressure that can be developed. So here we can actually measure the, the pressure that the diaphragm generates. It's called transdiaphragmatic pressure, or PDI, and it's equal to abdominal pressure minus intrapleural pressure. All right. And you can see here the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. You may remember from medical school, if you have a shortened muscle, you can't generate much tension. If you have a muscle that is stretched out, then its contraction can generate a lot of tension. And this is plotted in the so-called length tension relationship of muscle. So down here at D, these muscles are all already shortened. They're contracted and they can't generate any more tension. Up here, the muscles are longest, all right? So its contraction can generate the most tension and B and C, as you can see, are in the in-between. So basically, D is total lung capacity. This is when you've I've already gotten to maximal um, lung volume and consequently maximum diaphragm contraction, you can't go any further. Residual volume is when you've exhaled completely, 
So actually your diaphragm fibers are the longest and can generate the greatest tension. FRC is probably right about here. Remember, FRC is where you live. Now, this also means that hyperinflation, for example, is associated with diaphragm weakness or decreased diaphragm strength. So up here, you have a uh, long fibers in the diaphragm. You can generate great tension. Here, if the diaphragm is flattened because of hyperinflation, these fibers are shorter and they generate decreased tension. And this is shown here. This is a normal uh, diaphragm, normal length. With overinflation or hyperinflation, the diaphragm actually descends and these fibers are shorter. In restrictive lung disease, actually the fibers can be longer and therefore potentially generate even greater strength. We measure transdiaphragmatic pressure with a soft gel and gastric balloons. So we have a pressure transducer connected to a, um, a balloon which basically keeps the catheter clear of mucus, which is in the stomach. Second one is placed in the mid-esophagus. And remember, we talked about how to place these balloons so that you measure interpleural pressure. And so this pressure, abdominal minus pleural, uh, gives an indication of transdiaphragmatic pressure. Again, we have the, in this case, intragastric balloon, which measures abdominal pressure, and the intrasophageal balloon, which measures pleural pressure. And this is an example of a homemade version of this um, done by Chip Scott, who was a neonatal fellow with us a number of years ago. So the intrasophageal balloon measures pleural pressure. It's surrounded by negative pressure, so you do not want to overinflate the balloon. The volume will inflate causing back pressure. Uh, if you put too much volume in, it will inflate, causing back, back pressure. On the other hand, the intragastric balloon measures abdominal pressure. It's surrounded by positive pressure, so you don't want to underinflate that balloon because the volume will decrease, occluding the holes. So you need to put in the right amount. It's about, for most balloons, about half an ml in the intrapleural balloon and maybe a couple of mls in the intragastric balloon. So we have the subject swallow the esophageal balloon in the stomach. During inspiration, the pressure will be positive. And then we pull back until pleural pressure, that is, the esophageal pressure during inspiration is negative. And that again is shown here. So we put them all down in the stomach, have the person breathe. And when, when this balloon registers a negative pressure, it means it's down in the esophagus, not in the stomach or in the abdomen. So the procedure for performing transdiaphragmatic pressure in cooperative subject is to have the, have the subject exhale to residual volume, occlude the airway, ask them to inhale maximally measuring the pressure as they do so, and the best effort is used. Try several attempts. In uncooperative subjects, for example, infants, what we do is to occlude the airway and then stimulate the infant to cry, which is about as maximal an instrument uh, effort as we can get and measure the pressure as they do so. Again, best effort is used, and we want to try several attempts. Combined inspiratory muscle strength is basically um, now referred to as P inspiratory max, used to be known as maximal inspiratory pressure, and it's barometric pressure minus airway pressure. So basically, if we uh, have somebody breathe with a mouthpiece, for example, and measure that airway pressure against barometric pressure, we're getting combined inspiratory muscle strength. So Andrew Wen was a postdoctoral fellow in pediatric pulmonology, 1993 to 96, and he actually investigated this maximum inspiratory pressure, and it got the distinction uh, by the American College of Chest Physicians in the journal Chest as the pulmonary physiologic test of the month. And Andy asked how many maneuvers are required to measure maximal inspiratory pressure accurately. So the procedure for measuring maximum inspiratory pressure is to inhale to total lung capacity, that's for volume history, exhale to residual volume, occlude the airway, and then do a maximal inspiratory effort. Mean normal value is around 100 centimeters of water, and that minus two standard deviations is about 65 centimeters of water, and there is a significant learning effect. So again, we want to do this at residual volume where you have the largest uh, pressure 
It turns out that studies have shown that you really don't get that much difference if you do it at FRC versus residual volume, but technically speaking, this is the better. Um, and you can see here, FRC, total lung capacity, you would not want to do it. Residual volume, a bit more curvature, a bit longer fibers than at FRC. And again, hyperinflation decreases the maximal tension or the maximal, um, maximal historic pressure. Now, th this is the study that um, Andy Wen did. And he, for research purposes, um, basically had individuals perform 20 maneuvers. And you can see there is a significant learning effect. So this is a relatively normal individual. And you can see that at the beginning, didn't do too good a job. Um, after about five attempts, they got up to the range of 100, but by the end, actually got quite a bit higher than, uh, than originally. This is a patient with severe um, ventral muscle weakness with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And although the pattern is not as obvious, um, this individual does get a bit higher values uh, from 10 to 20 than um, before 10. So he studied 367 children and adults. And the blue bar shows three attempts within 5% uh, percent of each other. And the red bar shows the best of 20 attempts. And you can see that if you do 20 attempts, you do get higher values than you do uh, by the traditional three within 5% of each other. What he also showed was that if we used a MIP of less than 60 as a cutoff for abnormal, about 120 or so of the tests were abnormal. Whereas if we took the best of 20, only about maybe 95 uh, were abnormal. And similarly, uh, there were a number uh, greater that were clearly in the normal range um, with best of 20 compared to um, the three that were uh, within 5% of each other. Uh, what was in this intermediate range was not significantly different, but I think you can see the shift in this direction. Okay, expiratory muscle strength. Expiratory muscle strength can be used to play the trumpet, but in the main, um, most of us use this primarily to cough. So, expiratory muscles are not active during quiet breathing. Exhalation is passive. So, they're active in hypertonia as an exercise, but their primary function is cough. Abdominal muscles are the primary muscles used to cough. So, if you have a spinal cord injury, even below the thoracic level, you may impair your ability to cough because thoracic muscles are what are required for anatomy. So the way this is measured is to inhale to total lung capacity, occlude the airway, a maximal extra effort. This is to measure maximal extra pressure, sorry. The mean normal value is again about 100. Two standard deviations, the mean of minus two standard deviations is around 65. And again, there's a significant learning effect. Uh, these are normal values for children. So uh, what's plotted here is the uh, cough peak flow. So in this case, we're asking uh, individuals to cough and we're measuring their flow. So this is the fifth percentile, the mean 50th percentile and 95th percentile. And you can see that as children age, their values increase. This is for females, this is for males. So males, as in many things have increased skeletal muscle strength compared to females. Now, the guidelines for treatment of patients with muscular dystrophy, for example, and other neuromuscular diseases generally say that if the cough peak flow is less than 270 liters per minute or 4.5 liters per second, that this is an inadequate cough and one should consider the need for cough assist. Unfortunately, these parameters are only uh, measured in adults, right? And you can see that in adults here, they're quite a bit lower than even the fifth percentile. But even normal children who are younger than, let's say, 10, have a cough peak flow which is below this threshold. So keep in mind that this threshold is for adults, and you need to interpret uh, anything lower that according to the um, actual standards. And this is a very nice reference here for normal um, cough peak flow values in children. So another clinical law, 
always ask patients with ventilatory muscle weakness to cough during your physical examination, right? Sometimes you're going to hear, <coughs> and that's as much as they can give you. Sometimes this is not evident unless you actually ask patients to cough. If patients can't cooperate, parents might have um, some idea about how, how vigorous or strong their child's cough is, and they can help you out with this. But this is an important physical exam. Um, always ask children to cough. So what have we learned? In order to achieve adequate ventilation, ventilatory muscle power must be adequate to overcome the respiratory load. The diaphragm is the major muscle of breathing. Intercostal muscles function primarily to optimize diaphragm function. Diaphragm strength is measured as abdominal pressure minus pleural pressure. Condi combined inspiratory um, pressure is maximum inspiratory pressure or PI max, and it would be just airway pressure compared to barometric pressure. Expiratory muscles are most useful in coughing. So the respiratory balance here again is the important point. Ventilatory muscle power and central drive must be adequate to overcome the respiratory load in order to achieve adequate ventilation if these are decreased and or this is increased. And sometimes you get a combination. Somebody with mild uh, muscle weakness, for example, might have a pneumonia, which increases this, which will tip the balance in this direction. So if it's inadequate to overcome the respiratory load, respiratory failure does result. All right, next time, we will continue our exploration of ventilatory muscle function. Uh, thanks to our producer director, Katie LeWinter. And thank you for joining me in the great adventure, pediatric pulmonary physiology.